All right, so here again, we've got a blue lobular tumor, kind of similar from low power to the last case, right? Um, <clears throat> you can see there are some little pale areas here. Um, this is a good example of how not everything that's blue and basaloid in the skin is a basal cell carcinoma. Basaloid tumors, oftentimes we have to think of basal cell carcinoma first because they're so common. So one important thing for people that are not derm paths that are doing some derm path but are, are general pathologists is to make sure that you don't miss something that's not a basal cell and call it a basal cell. That's Sometimes that's, that's uh, going to be a real problem, like calling uh, something basal cell that actually is a Merkel cell or some other worse type of carcinoma. And it can happen even to derm paths and to anyone. And so it's, that's one thing I always have to be thinking of because when we look at a melanocytic lesion, we know, oh, melanocytic, I need to be more careful. But the things that we know we need to be more careful about, those are the things that we oftentimes handle at least well enough. We say, well, I'm kind of worried. I don't know. Let's get an expert opinion or something. It's the things that we think are easy that actually are, are not. Those are the things that really get us in trouble. Those are the pitfalls, right, that we, that we have to always watch out for. So when I'm looking at a blue neoplasm from low power, things that can help me is usually basal cell carcinoma has a unique kind of stroma around it, kind of oftentimes a little bit mixoid and fibrous mixed together. Oftentimes you'll see clefting and mucin right around the edge, even at low power. And so at, at lower power, if I don't see clefting and mucin, um, right away I start thinking this may be something not basal cell carcinoma, okay? And I've had times where I thought, well, I can't really decide, and, and I called something an invasive carcinoma, and I said, it, I think it's probably a basal cell, but I'm not totally sure. Maybe it could be a basaloid squame or an inexal carcinoma, but, but I don't see any obvious inexal differentiation, and thank goodness I've had times where I did that and felt like I was being overly hedgy, <clears throat> and then the tumor recurred rapidly, and was a poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma and was very aggressive. So, <clears throat> especially on a small biopsy, if you're not sure, it's good to be cautious in that area and don't just blow things off as basal cell if you're not um, totally sure that it is. All right, so here we can see we don't have peripheral palisading really, we don't have clefting, we don't have mucin, and so all of those things tell me now we're not dealing with a basal cell carcinoma, uh, in this case probably. Let's see if we think that it looks uh, malignant. I think I've got some let me move my window here. I added uh, some little annotations to help me find the areas I was looking for. Obviously, big, ugly pleomorphic cells. There are also lots of mitoses in this case, but there is definitely pleomorphism here and much more atypia than in the previous cases. So I think what we're dealing with here is a malignant tumor. Now the question is, what kind of malignant tumor? Is it a poorly diff squame with some clear cell change, or is it actually sebaceous carcinoma? And there are a lot of mitoses, yes, as, as someone pointed out. So <clears throat> that's the, the problem, I think, with, and then here's a big atypical looking mite, right? That's got too many chromosomes, I'm sure. So what do you think? Do you think it's enough? Yeah, so I've seen people answer sebaceous carcinoma. And yes, that, that is my diagnosis for this case. The vacuoles here are fine and delicate. They do indent the nucleus. They are definitely not as, um, as uh, clear and crisp maybe as the previous cases I showed you. This is the big problem, I think. Sebaceous neoplasms seem simple at the outset because there's only a few diagnoses. There's sebaceous hyperplasia, which I didn't show you today. I didn't have one uh, handy. Sebaceous adenoma, sebaceoma, sebaceous carcinoma, and a couple of other weird things. But really, there's not a lot of different sebaceous options to choose from. So it seems like it should be um, pretty easy to sort these out. I think that you, you have a problem at both ends of the spectrum. On one end, if you can look at a tumor and say, this is definitely a sebaceous tumor, the question is, is it atypical enough to call it malignant or is it a benign uh, tumor? At the other end, you can say, whoa, this thing's definitely malignant, but I'm not sure if the vacuoles or the clearing is quite enough to be true sebaceous change sebaceous differentiation, or if it's just clear cell change in a squame. So this is a problem that I encounter all the time. And we know that this is a problem because people keep publishing different stains to try to identify sebaceous tumors. Um, EMA um, will stain the vacuoles and highlight them. So will adipophilin, uh, which is a stain I don't have in my lab, but I know people that, um, <clears throat> that, uh, that have used that and like it. Um, there are other people who have tried a variety of stains. Um, our group published that um, factor 13A, only a certain clone, the AC1A1 clone, 
will actually stain the nuclei of the mature sebacytes in both benign and malignant sebaceous tumors and seems to do so in a relatively sensitive and specific fashion. Although after we published that, I've continued to try to use it. And I found a few times where it didn't really work as well as I thought in something that I knew must be sebaceous. And I've also seen it have some kind of wishy-washy staining in squames and other things. So what I've learned over time is that, that there's not a perfect one, one, uh, one solution stain to solve these. And so what I do is if I look at it and I decide this is malignant and I see what I think are obvious sebacytes, I may still use stains to help support that um, or to help rule it out. But in the end, I'll say, okay, I think this is sebaceous carcinoma. And if I'm not sure, I sometimes will say um, uh, invasive carcinoma with the comment that this could be a squam with clear cell change, but another possibility that's less favored would be sebaceous carcinoma and that I tried the stains and I didn't see definitive sebacyte differentiation. The point of that is that <clears throat> sebaceous carcinomas, A, can be associated with neurotory sometimes, particularly when they're away from the head and neck. If you have a sebaceous carcinoma on the body away from the head and neck, most likely that patient has neurotory syndrome. On near the eye, which is a very common site for sebaceous carcinoma, most of those are not associated with neurotory syndrome, actually. They're, they're important to recognize for a different reason, though, because sebaceous carcinoma is right near the, in the ocular area, as opposed to say squamous cell carcinoma, they have a real tendency to spread back into the conjunctiva. And so from my um, ophthalmic surgery colleagues, they, they've told me, yeah, we really need to know when it's a sebaceous carcinoma near the eye, they'll often do scouting biopsies of the conjunctiva to see how far the pagetoid spread is extended back around the eye. It really, you know, really serious uh, situation for the patient there. So, <clears throat> so that's an important thing to keep in mind. So uh, that, I think that this case though fits pretty nicely for sebaceous carcinoma. It's definitely got enough atypia in my opinion, and it's got cells that I believe are convincing uh, sebacytes. But you'll definitely find that this is a subjective area and people can have differing opinions um, as in much of derm path, but especially I think sebaceous tumors. So, so they seem simple at first, but the more I do them, the more I, sometimes I throw up my hands and I say, there's no truth. There's no, I don't believe in sebaceous tumors anymore. And then my fellows laugh and tell me that I'm, I just need to calm down and go home for the day and I'll be fine tomorrow. And usually I am. All right.